welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We're broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world. We're bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on TikTok. A very good evening to you folks. Please do send in your greetings. Tell us where you are watching from. And please do share the broadcast and retweet the broadcast. That's the way that we get out to new people. And on TikTok, please do send in your comments. We've had a very good viewing week on TikTok. We have now surpassed 200,000 likes on our overall channel, which is very good going for a force for good. We are at 13,300 followers and climbing. So if you're on TikTok, please do give us a follow. And of course, give us a follow, a subscribe on YouTube. Now, tonight we have got Niall Fraser back as our guest. He'll be coming on at 7.30 and we'll be talking to him up until around 10 or 5 to 8. And he's always an interesting character. He's made a new short video which he's putting out on Twitter and we'll be talking to him about that and about his activism as well. So stick around for Niall Fraser at the bottom of the hour. Now, if you're on TikTok, you won't actually see that interview. You will need to go to youtube.com forward slash UK, a force for good to see that interview with Niall. But a great guest, a great guest. And obviously, just before the bottom of the hour as well, we will be having our On This Day in British History and our competition to win which was not won last week, a King Charles III coronation badge, which says, God save the king. That's a very nice little badge, and it's yours, and all you need to do is send in the answer to the question, which we'll be asking at the bottom of the hour, sending it to contact at aforceforgood.uk, our email, contact at aforceforgood.uk. Great. Folks, what is on your mind this evening and what shall we talk about? Now, Derek was first in. Good evening, Alistair and fellow unionists. I hope that everyone is having a great Wednesday evening in the great British city of Glasgow today. And it's been a great day so far, hasn't it? Just, I mean, it's so unusual to be sitting here at seven o'clock with the heat of the day. It's really quite remarkable, but very enjoyable. We're certainly not complaining about it. Derek is outside at Weatherspoons. Fantastic. Fantastic. And good evening to Debbie also. And there is Niall Fraser, our guest. Says, hoping for another great show. Well, that's for certain. Hi to Adam from the great British state of England. And Melissa, who says, not reading the TikTok comments is self-care. I know what you mean. <laughs> Anyways, a lot of good folk on TikTok that support us. And for those who don't, well, stick around and you might find out stuff. Adam says, did you see the Scottish Parliament debate on the protection of devolution and the Scottish Parliament? No. We didn't, Adam. When was that? That sounds like compulsive viewing. Hi there, Stuart, and to Kat, and to Catherine. Kat's from sunny East Ayrshire. And Robert is from sunny Galashiels. Do you know what, Robert? I was just thinking about Galashiels the other day, and remember when A Force for Good had our counter demo against the Scottish Nationalists I think that was round about this time it was in fact the 1st of June 
It was the 1st of June in 2019 when A Force for Good was in Gala Shields. That's it's tomorrow, the 1st of June. Um, AUOB said there was 5,000 there, but the actual was 2,122 that we counted back in Gala Shields four years ago. Goodness me, how time flies. Christopher says, good evening from sunny but slightly chilly Falkirk. <laughs> Adam says, Silver Fox on YouTube is worth a watch. Okay. And Teresa wonders, why has Sturgeon not been questioned? I think that's a question that we're all asking, Teresa. Adam says that the 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 debate on devolution was yesterday. Well, talking about debates on devolution tomorrow, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown is having a what he's calling a rally, which I think is his term for an invited press conference, basically, at the cent central halls in Toll Cross in Edinburgh, and that's at seven thirty, and he is going to be using that to big up his plans to what he calls um, renew our democracy and rebuild our economy. Um, and perhaps he could have put a third one in there and how to mess up the union because I have waded through all 155 pages. It took me three days of making notes and I'm going to release an article summarizing it all so that you don't have to read through 155 pages. Because as I said last week, this is essentially what he's wanting Keir Starmer to implement. Now the question is, will they implement this um, <clears throat> in its entirety or will a lot of this actually be taken out and not implemented, and I certainly hope that some of it is not implemented, because while some of it is okay, and while some of it may or may not work, when he gets into the matters of the Constitution, oh my, he is treading on very dangerous ground that unfortunately he does not have a particularly good reputation around. So let me just go into some of that. When it's all divided into 12 chapters, and let's just start with some of the good stuff. He has, a, he has a chapter on what he calls cleaning up Westminster. And that's fairly harmless stuff. It's about, about uh, you know, new bodies to oversee the MPs and so on. There's nothing really that one can take um, too, much, uh, too much fright in. There's, there's other stuff where he's talking about uh, rejuvenating economically parts of England and he's got some various ideas to do that and some of them might work and some of them might be good ideas I don't know I would advise him to stick with those ideas the ideas for economic rejuvenation um, in parts of England you know you can't really go wrong with that some of these ideas will, will, will may well work just concentrate on that. I think that's what the Labour Party can be quite good at. But please, 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 please do not get into messing up the Constitution again. Because it seems to me that... Well, I can't really find very much good to say about any of his ideas here. His, his main one is to transform... To, to abolish the House of Lords. And then to not just abolish it, but replace it with what he's calling the Assembly of the Regions and Nations, which is to say an assembly, elected assembly of around 200 members elected in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the English regions. And these people will be representing their regions or their nations in what he says here an explicit way. And furthermore, they will have the power to embed, as he puts it, uh, certain constitutional articles, which is to say that if the government passes a law 
and the upper house, his new assembly, thinks that contradicts a particular previous law that's that's what's that's protected then we can prevent that law going through unless there's a, some kind of majority vote in the upper house to do it so what that would mean for example is that the latest um, a few weeks ago at the GRR controversy that if the Tory government wanted to do what it did which is to say prevent Holyrood passing that then this would have to go to the upper house and if the upper house thought that that action contradicted the spirit of devolution and contradicted the Sewell convention which is a convention which requires the government to not normally do such things then they can stop it so in other words what he's trying to do is to entrench the powers of Holyrood and the devolved assemblies in such a way that the governing party of the day can't get its, can't um, overturn anything that Holyrood or the devolved assemblies do. Now, that to me is an absurd thing to do because it's it's not strengthening the union. That's that's strengthening the power of the devolved assemblies against the centre. And this theme runs through his entire document here, the idea of strengthening the devolved assemblies against the centre. And all that is going to do is empower the separatist parties. And it's unbelievable to me that he doesn't see that. And I was wondering, is he just doing this mainly for Wales in the hope that in Wales there's always going to be a Labour administration running the Senate? Is that his main reason for doing it? Because in Scotland, it's not going to help matters for the Labour Party or for the Union at all to give, to give such exclusive power to them. So throughout his document, he... He basically is running down the union. There's very little here that will strengthen the union. Very little at all. The only thing possibly is um, something that he's come up with called the councils of the nations and regions, which will be various councils and sub-councils made up of the politicians of the various nations and regions of England. And they will be required to get round a table every so often and cooperate cooperate because they're all going to sign up to a solidarity clause. Oh, I, I can see them doing that. So seriously, um, very little there. So what should be done? What should be going into that? Well, I'll tell you in a moment. Stuart says Westminster won't buy it. You're very possibly right. And I don't think the Labour Party should buy it either. <clears throat> Christopher says we meddle with the House of Lords at our peril they are good and often impartial check on the executive yes and one of the things and while the House of Lords may need some kind of reform I'm not saying that it doesn't but one of the good things about the House of Lords is that it does not break down on a national level it's not Scottish Lords voting against English Lords voting against Northern Irish voting against Welsh it's just a kind of pan-UK body where everybody's really just voting and considering the best interests of the United Kingdom generally. And that's a, that's a strength of the House of Lords as it is presently established. And that should continue in whatever form that the Second Chamber continues in. But that pan-UK element is really valuable. But what Gordon Brown wants to do is he wants to break all that down and institute national divides, Scottish members of the Assembly, English ones, Northern Irish ones, Welsh ones. So there's going to be this this national conflict. It's going to occur. It's a foolish idea, a foolish way of reforming the Lords. And um, But you're right here. Christopher Labour will go straight down the regional route for England. Also a big mistake. Adam says, but if Labour wins power nationwide, anything 
will happen nationwide. Mm. Um, so what should be done to strengthen the union? Well, it should be the sort of things that we've been talking about for a while. And let's just recap them. And um, one of the things that should be done is that we should overturn the idea that everything is devolved by default unless it is specifically written down as reserved. OK, what Brown wants to do is he wants to institutionalize that particular settlement where everything is devolved by default. That is to say, things that we know about, things that we ha don't know about yet, things that we've forgotten about, things that might be incoming in the future. Everything's to be considered to be devolved unless it's specifically reserved. Well, it should be the other way around. Everything should be considered by default to be reserved unless it's written down to be devolved. And we, we laid that out in our magazine, Do More Together, when we talked about the devolution settlement. It was one of the very, very first things that we said when we said, get the devolution settlement the right way round. Another thing that should be done is to ensure that the civil service can't be used to break up the United Kingdom. British taxpayers should not be paying money to the civil service to destroy the very country itself. Now that's a completely different matter from the civil service being allowed to to simply carry out government policy. That's fine. But if government policy or the policies of the administration is to actually destroy the UK, then the British taxpayers should not be paying for that. So civil servants should not be allowed to do that. And that requires a law to be written. You can't just ask the Scottish branch of the British Civil Service to do that. There has to be a law that stops them from doing that. And hello, yes, of course, we wrote that law. We explained it all here. We even wrote it basically in legalese, a law to stop the civil service pushing the indie agenda. Now, that should have been brought in in the first week of Boris Johnson's premiership in 2019. It should have been brought in actually way, way, way back. It should have been brought in prior to, 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 the, to the devolution actually going through in 1999. But nothing's been done and the situation has just been allowed to go on and on. Indeed, the civil service needs to be reformed completely, completely. Uh, we spoke about that last week, and I noticed in the uh, newspapers today it was saying that some, some uh, union leaders are suggesting that members of the Home Office and the Border Force will go on strike because they don't like the immigration law that the Tories are promoting. Well, Members of the border force should not even be allowed to go on strike. I mean, border force is like it's like it's not a militarized arm, but it is a light. It is an, a line of defense for the United Kingdom, and in that sense, anybody in that line of defense for the United Kingdom should not be allowed to go on strike. So all of that needs to be sorted as well. So think of the kind of leaders that we're really needing to bring in what has to be done. Are they out there? Well. Let's hope so, and let's hope that they can get ideas from exactly the sort of things that we're saying. Um, another simple thing as well is simply to raise the profile of Britishness in the average household. And one of the ways you do that is when the British government writes to people, then it should brand the, the, the materials so that people know it's coming from the United Kingdom. This was brought back to my attention today when I was when somebody sent me a copy of of this thing from HR HM Revenue and Customs. Now, back at the end of the year, everybody who was entitled in Britain, which was millions of people, received this letter. The cost of living payments for eligible households. And what that meant is that it basically the UK government was going to be given hundreds of pounds to your household to help with the cost of living and to help with the cost of gas and electricity. But if you read this, it doesn't mention once 
the UK government. It doesn't mention once the British government. It doesn't mention once the UK Treasury or the British Treasury or anything. And so a lot of people in Scotland would get this. And not everybody knows what HMRC means or even what HM Revenue and Customs is. And some people might even think it's a branch of the the, the Scottish administration. So, what well, you know, this, the, this needs to be like, there needs to be a Union Jack in here. This needs to be coloured. Um, you know, there needs to be branding that tells you very clearly the UK government is going to send you X amount of money between these months. And so people say, oh, well, maybe the UK government's good for something. Okay. Very simple branding. And we've been on this. We've been on this since furlough when people were getting thousands of pounds from the UK government. But when they did a, when they did a study, they found out that many people in Scotland didn't even know it was the UK government. They thought it was from Holyrood. Brand the furlough scheme British. Another policy that we wrote about back in autumn 2021. 18 months have gone by and still they're not branding their, their, their money, their, the, the uh, offers that they make to people. They're still not branding it as British. So people don't know where that money's coming from because not everybody's as switched on as we are, you know. So that's another thing, brand UK payments clearly. And just just other things like that that suggest that you've got to get your act in order. You know, somebody sent us this cutting. Westminster could fall before it is repaired. This is from the Daily Telegraph of the 17th of May. There is a real and rising risk that the Houses of Parliament will be destroyed by a catastrophic event before they are repaired, MPs warned last night. Parliament's Public Accounts Committee said the thousands who worked in the Palace of Westminster were at risk from leaks, fire and falling masonry. They said it was, quote, incredible that no decisions had been made about how it should be restored five years after MPs agreed to take action. Five years come and gone and nothing's been done and the problem has just been allowed to fester. And I thought that's, that's almost like a very good a metaphor for the style of British government that we have had in the last 10 years. Just kind of sweep it under the carpet, as it were. But, you know, something like Westminster, um, we've always said as well, move it out for a few years, move it around the country for a few years, bring it closer to uh, various big cities all these sorts of stuff there's all all sorts of interesting interesting uh, ideas that can be done there as well so the british government really has to stop getting the easy things wrong and those are some of the suggestions that we would make that gordon brown should be making and that we will be lobbying the labor government if it comes in to make instead of going down this fruitless route and absurd route of basically uh, nationalising, making the second chamber a nationalistic chamber in London. That's nobody's demanding that. Nobody's asking for that. There's no, there's no uh, demographic that's going to be appeased by that. It's just a crazy idea, and it will do Labour no favours. And at the moment, as we've said. The House of Lords doesn't even have any SNP members in it, whereas Brown is proposing a second chamber that will be full of them. I don't understand his political thinking at all. Unless, well, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to move Britain to a federal state. I think that's his end goal. Anyway. Anyway, we've got our guest coming up. I see our guest is in the green room. Niall will be with us in five minutes. Before then, though, we're going to have On This Day in British History. And I'll ask a question afterwards about it. And the winner will get this cracking little badge. 
So on this day in British history, several things, several things happened, uh, obviously. Um, I'm going to start with the death of the lady who invented the Barras, the Glasgow Barras, uh, Mayor Margaret MacIver. She died on this day, 31st of May, 1958. We've got a picture of her here that we'll put up. She was born in Galston and she moved to Bridgeton. And she was a bit of an entrepreneur and she hired out um, hand carts, basically, uh, barrows to the, uh, to the street traders and made a success of this and eventually bought some land in the Carlton area and roofed the area and also set up the Barrowland Ballroom, which still exists today. So that's Mary MacIver, a, 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 a founding mother, if you like, of modern Glasgow. Um, what else on this day, 31st of May 1916, we had the Battle of Jutland, which was the biggest naval battle of the First World War. And that was fought between the British and the Germans. The man in charge of the British was Sir John Jellicoe. Fantastic name. Got a picture of him there that we'll stick up. And that's, that's Jellicoe there. And he was fighting Reinhard Stier, who was the German. And it was basically, <clears throat> okay, it was basically a indecisive, indecisive battle. Okay, <clears throat> people are, historians are, are uh, don't really know if anybody actually won it, but there were a lot of casualties, one of them being Jack Cornwell, who distinguished himself on HMS Chester as a 16-year-old. Um, stick the photo up there, please. And he stayed at his post. He stayed at his post and uh, while all around him were dead. And he unfortunately was mortally wounded and died three days later but he's gone down in British history as the boy Cornwell and he was awarded a Victoria Cross for that and he was only 16 years old okay and also in that battle as well the Queen's mother uh, the Queen's father who was to become George the sixth he actually fought at the Battle of Jutland being the only as far as I know the only king to have fought in a battle for well certainly during the 20th century anyway although there'll be members of there are members of the royal family who have fought in all of these wars of course but the only king the only person who became a king who has fought in a war in our living memory Okay, good. <clears throat> well, that that will do. Well, there's just one other thing. The um, continuing the World War theme. The Glasgow Cenotaph was opened today by L. Haig, back on the thirty first of May, in nineteen twenty four. And there's the cenotaph. And in fact, there at the bottom, you see what might be one of the street traders hand carts or barras because that's that's at the exact time actually as Mary MacIver was setting up the barras she started to to roof the area in 1924 that exact year that exact year that the cenotaph was was opened cool well we've got Niall Fraser coming straight up <clears throat> And uh, we'll introduce Niall, and then I'll ask a question while I'm speaking to Niall. But folks, do please say hello to our guest this evening, Niall Fraser. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. Hello. Thanks for having me as well, Alistair. I love all these old pictures of Glasgow you bring up. They're absolutely stunning. 
especially picking out that old hand cart as well. Just Aye. absolutely stunning. It's, it's funny the wee things that linking it all together. It's beautiful. Yes, yes. Well, that's one of the wonders of the internet is being able to find all these photographs, which for for many years you you could only find if you maybe went into a library or something like that. Oh, but sure. the the digitization of uh, lots of these archives now is just a, a, a wonderful thing, absolutely wonderful. We're, we're living in an age where we've never had so much information and yeah. so much knowledge, and yet people seem often not always to be taken advantage of that information and knowledge. Niall, I thought by way of introducing your um, chat tonight, mm -hmm. we'd play your latest video. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to start, eh? Aye. Aye. Uh, it's a two-minute video, and so we'll just uh, we'll play that just now, and then we'll talk about what you're t talking about and referencing in the mm -hmm. video. Okay, cool, perfect. Scotland is at the crossroads, ladies and gentlemen, and it saddens me deeply that we've ended up here. But in the same vein, hope never dies. I'm here in Roslyn because we are on the precipice. We've only got two options now, Scotland. On one hand, we've been offered a future. A future where the state controls more and more of your life. Where we're segregated into 20 minute ghettos. When even your diet is dictated by the authorities. Men and women will become some freakish rainbow amalgamation. Families will be a thing of the past. Free speech will be snuffed out. Where every movement you make is tracked and logged by the surveillance state. Every call you make is screened and listened to. A future where your privacy is spat on. Life in the digital cage. The digital hamster wheel. This future is what is being imposed on you by those in Holyrood, whether you like it or not. The illusion of choice between Labour, Tories, SNP, the Lib Dems, the Greens, that's all that it is, an illusion. These parties and politicians are all part of the same corrupt political human centipede that gives us all the scripted huffing and hawing at Holyrood, where they all march together in unison. Our politicians don't care about us, ladies and gentlemen. That much is obvious. And on the other hand, a golden age is awaiting us. We only require the bravery to grab it, the bravery to tell the human centipede we're not playing anymore. Not one more vote should go to these parties. Trust in us, Scotland, and we will lead us out this darkness. We will return discipline to the schools. We will eliminate the trans ideology. Day one, we'll make every transaction in Holyrood transparent and public. We'll open the books and we're going to keep them open. We're going to rebuild Scotland and we're going to rebuild our traditions. And we're going to do it all under the glorious banner of family. You know, the future can be as bright as we want it to be. The only limit is our collective imagination. So Scotland, what way are we going? What road are we taking? The one that leads us directly into digital captivity, confusion and chaos, or the one that leads us to our own liberation? The road that destroys, or the road that creates? The only thing that we need for you, Scotland, is the bravery to wave goodbye to the human centipede, the bravery to vote the other way, to put your belief and faith in us, the Scottish Family Party, because we will not fail you. <laughs> oh, there's a lot, to, a lot to unpack in that one. <laughs> <laughs> very passionate, I have to say. A very Thank passionate um, presentation. And I like the way that you initially had us uh, depressed, feeling yes. there was no way out. And then you came back in there with there is a golden age awaiting us it's so frustrating and... though Alistair, isn't it you can feel it it's just it's just slipping out with our grasp you can feel this golden age as much as i can mm. yes 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 and um and then at the end you gave the a plug for the scottish family party which we can mm. maybe talk about uh, in a few moments but um do you really think that things are i mean you use the phrase that illusion of choice and I know what you mean by that. And would you, is that something that you would s stand by? You, do you really think, um, you know, there's really nothing there? I, I would certainly stand by it in, in large swathes of the Scottish government, especially uh, the SNP, Labour, the Lib Dems and the Greens. Uh, having so many overlapping policies uh, and, and so many things that they, they all vote together on, uh, that it does seem to be one blob. Rather, and you, you, I mean, you can um, you can sort of uh, insult the Tories as much as you want, but they seems to be the only ones that's voting against um, the the wacky policies coming out of Holyrood at the moment. Um, 
but I, I totally stand by the fact that I mean these parties are all working almost in unison uh, and patting themselves on the back whilst they do it. Um, I, I mean, I just had to make the speech because I feel that I, I have to capture the feeling that a lot of us have about the establishment and the predicament that we sort of find ourselves in Scotland and both the UK time and time again voting for the lesser of two evils, you know? Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, in fact, I was just reading an article today by Alan Cochran and he's talking about Holyrood and it just happened to be here on my desk, and he's saying about the SNP, and the other parties have appeared only too happy not to rock the boat and instead to accept their sinecures and salaries at Holyrood. Yeah, I, I could, cannot agree with that more. Yeah, 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 and there's, there is that feeling. There's also, there's also a feeling that... <clears throat> um, no matter who you vote for, nothing is really going to change on the major issues as well, and that's that's a, a real worry, especially at the British level. Yes. Um, because, and I'm not being party political about this one way or the other, but there is a feeling that the Tories haven't really done very much to to address some of the big issues, uh, the big national macro issues, um, such as bringing forward Brexit. Uh, getting the benefits of Brexit, yes. um, keeping the union together, fighting back strongly. The, only in the recent past, only in the last six months, have they started to fight back against the SNP. Yeah. But prior to that, it was just let the SNP do what they want and will not fight back because it's, it's too much danger, mm -hmm. too much bother as well. And of course, on the immigration issue, which in fact, they've, the, the Tories have only increased it. Yeah. They haven't decreased it. So there's these absolute frustrations there. Um, people will still go to the polls, though, and they'll, they'll vote because we, we tend to vote for a lesser of two evils. Don't you go along with that thinking? Uh, people will go. I mean, and this is why I put in the bit in the speech about having the bravery to vote the other way almost. That's that's all that we require, Alistair, is, uh, is the bravery to vote the other way, is to say, no, I won't be voting with the established parties, Labour, SNP, Lib Dems, Tories, whatever it is, whatever it may be. Um, I, I'm going to go with some of the smaller parties because we know for certain that uh, these parties are, at least to a degree, way less corrupt uh, than the ones that are established. Um, and it's all about trying to come together behind one banner in order to defeat this uh, this attitude that you're talking about. Nothing seems to be getting done. Our tires seem to be spinning in the mud, Alistair, but nothing seems to be getting done. Uh, immigrants are still arriving on boats. Um, like you were talking about earlier, um, the, the UK is branding uh, on their payments and stuff like that. We need to get everything sorted. There's so many things that we, we need to fix imminently. Uh, but then again, we just seem like we're going nowhere. It's mm. really quite an annoying feeling. And yeah. the impositions, you know, these, um, just as an example, I mean, this U.S. that came into Glasgow just recently, these impositions just keep coming. Uh, I mean, the slow totalitarian tiptoe just moves onward uncontested. I mean, uh, do we have any opposition in Holyrood? This is what, why I'm having to do what I'm having to do. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that that that's good. And you mentioned the Eulers thing. Um, there's no opposition, for example, to this, the to the, the to the uh, climate, to the car, the anti-carbon agenda. There's no opposition to that because everybody has signed up to believe that it's a real thing, and that you know there's so every policy that's derived from that philosophy, you know, yeah. all the parties promote the same the same policies just to a greater or lesser extent so that's that's like another thing where there's no proper division there's no um the idea of a two-party system is one party believes all that stuff and the other party believes everything differently yep. and you can choose which side you stand on but when all the when the parties are just meshing in in that way tessellating Thing. Yes, you've hit the nail on the head. Tessellating, what a word that is. <laughs> what an incredible word. Your vocabulary knows no bounds. Tessellating, you've heard it here on the Force for Good podcast. Tessellating, get that in the notebook. Uh, I mean, I just, uh, this, this you, Les, I mean, this is the kind of policy that it's just, it's almost suddenly happened upon people, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. People are having to replace and upgrade cars, 
or face constant fines. Uh, you know, a policy that's totally devoid of any public consultation. It just happens upon people. I've seen that uh, our good friend David Clues, a friend of the show, is leading a protest in Glasgow against this very topic oh, over the weekend. I mean, for me, it's digital segregation enforced by fines, the same way how mm -hmm. COVID was enforced. COVID, there wasn't many bobbies on the street arresting people at beaches. It was all enforced via fines hitting people where it hurts the most at the pocket in the pocket at the worst possible time across the living or across the lockdown crisis so uh yes yes it feels like they're um scott gov's almost abusing its citizenry uh, uh, to the fullest extent right yeah now that helps to explain what you what you uh what we're talking about there in the first half of your video and when you talk about the golden age there are you thinking about, is there any sort of, um, what, what, what are you envisaging with so, that? With, uh, I, I, I had to put the golden age in it because really we can do anything we want to do, right? Um, uh, an idea that I've got is to rebuild traditional structures um, using traditional building materials and sort of try to rebuild uh, our traditions and make home ownership almost 100% home ownership across the land. Um, but obviously we need to be using traditional materials and stuff like that as well. And that will go a lot in terms of cutting off the skill shortages that we've got to know. We've got a lot of kids growing up these days without a trade, without any real uh, tangible skills. So a lot of digital skills, yes. Uh, but, um, you know, did we want to keep the craftsman skills uh, available. We, we, we can't allow this to die out. So we need to sort of revitalize these core values and score, core skills and, and make um, Scotland a place. Fun. You know, it's so great that everyone wants to come here. Uh, mm. And yet we're, we're being disused uh, almost as work. We've got so many national resources, so many things going for us, but we just don't use it to our advantage. It really. Mm. Well, a, a lot of that as well is is due <clears throat> due to bad philosophy from the Greens and the SNP and so on. That, for example, they don't want to take all our all our carbon resources. Um, they don't want to even touch them. They want, and it's similarly with the Labour Party now, they're saying they're not going to do any more drilling for oil. Or anything like that. Well, I mean, straight away that's impoverishing people. Straight yeah. away that's going to make um, the cost of living greater. And there's a big attack now on farming, and it's it's only really just starting in the UK. But it's Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. I was reading uh, last week that they're they're wanting to slaughter a huge amount of the cattle herd uh, for for what you know yes. for a presumed the emissions, whether from the cows or on the materials that are required to continue to keep the cows um, going and the fertilizer and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, all that's going to do is price literal meat, which is yeah. the best food you can get. It's going to make it too expensive for most people. Um, and so it's almost like our politicians are against us, you know. I, I don't... <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah, it, is. it is almost. Uh, mm. Carry on what you're saying, so I don't interrupt. No, no, you know, you're right. Um, that's that's really what I was saying. I, I say almost because I don't always like to be too definite about that because mm -hmm. that's that. If that were the case, then we're all in greater trouble than we thought we were in. Yes. <laughs> but we might we might be there. Mm -hmm. We might be there. there. There is certainly like evil people around and at the top of various organizations who do who are working to a plan um, and there is a certain level of of um, that that one has to be conscious of mm -hmm. um, consciously directed evil you know and that's really come out as well quite strongly in the last few years started to really notice that as the powers of control over people have have developed especially through digital yeah. mechanisms and smartphones and so on and just seeing the power uh, and let's hope that our politicians will use that power for good but we've always got to be conscious that there will be people who use it for bad there always yeah. has been there always will be we've got to protect ourselves from that so in that sense i mean your organization 
the Scottish Family Party, they're conscious of those sorts of things and they're they're trying to protect people. Um, is there anything you want to talk? Because you mentioned the Scottish Family Party there at the last part of your, yeah, your it's, video. It's, uh, every time I mention them, I get caught up. Everybody's like, uh, yeah, there's another Scottish Family Party political broadcast, as if uh, no other political party is allowed to recruit. Only Labour is allowed to recruit. Only the Tories, only the Lib Dems. As if these smaller parties are not allowed a voice. <laughs> We're not allowed to recruit because you'll be vote split. No, I'm, I'm not falling for that trap again. Not a chance. Uh, guys, please do join the Scottish Family Party. It's just, uh, as a first line of defence, I mean, we plan on fielding candidates in every constituency uh, for the Westminster elections coming with the Hamilton and Rutherglen by-election likely coming up imminently that uh, I should be running against uh, Margaret Ferrier if she does decide to run. But I mean, the plan is um, to upset the apple cart as much as possible, especially with these other parties. You know, as I've been described in the speech, they all seem very connected, almost like a human centipede. It's time, it really is time to start thinking differently here in Scotland, especially when it comes to political parties. I mean, I don't want my vote going to someone I don't trust and that I don't trust will do the right thing and it will not stand up for the constituents. And in fact, a lot of the time, their constituents are getting sold down the river. So we want to be different with the SFP. We've got a few cutting-edge, completely new policies to tickle the curiosity of the Scottish electorate. But at the same time, we are promising stability, good governance, open and transparent exchanges. Uh, and it's, you know, for once in a lifetime, let's just do it. You know, let's just vote the other way just once to see if we can get a result. Uh, I mean, we can't... Well, who's it? Einstein and definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, we're never going to get a different result unless we start voting differently, guys. Mm. Well, um, Chris Christopher says the SFP is a true voice of reason and decency, both much needed qualities in Scotland. Thanks very much for that, Christopher. I've seen a lot of great comments coming in. Uh, Derek Hart, Christopher Glenn, Stuart MacDonald, Catherine Rainey. Great, great comments. Thanks. Good, good. Um, just before we continue, I'm going to ask the question for our viewers um, about um, on this day in British history, and the prize is this little badge here. So please send in your answers to contact at aforceforgood.uk and you'll get this, and you'll also get a copy of our latest issue of Union Heart. And the question is, on this day... 31st of May 1916, the biggest naval battle of World War I was fought. What was the name of that naval battle? Send your answer to contact at aforceforgood.uk and we'll announce the winner at the top of the hour. Great stuff. So, yeah, back to the Scottish Family Party. There's a by-election, um, a, a local election coming up Um <clears throat> Two Thursdays away, I think. It's uh, just the Bells Hill by-election. Ah, it's Bells Hill, that's the one. Are you standing at that? Uh, no, so I, th I think we'll be fielding a candidate in that one. But I think that's just about with my boundary. Uh, I've said before, I don't know I work in the, the SMP-run councils, <laughs> especially when uh, Jordan Linden, there was a huge big protection ring thrown up around him, especially when he got exposed. Uh, it's just outrageous what happens in these councils. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't think I'd be able to contain myself, Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we need to get you into some kind of legislature. I think that's mm. that's that's important, so that you've got an outlet for for your passion and for your ideas. And um, um, Bells Hills at North Lanarkshire. That's North Lanarkshire. Yes. Yeah. Well, there is a a candidate. There is a um, a councillor who represents the British Unionist Party. Yep. He had a great um, election, and nobody's seen him winning, but he, he won by a landslide almost. Yes. So he yes. won by a mile. Yes, incredible. Um, and uh, the British Unionist Party is like very much uh, everything that, that we are forced for good agree with anyway. Mm -hmm. And he... What, he got elected because, um, well, he was a well-known local character, and his constituency was very much that way. His council constituency is very much that um, mm -hmm. traditional British unionist. So I think that's fantastic that he's at least there. So 
you do you do occasionally get get uh, good folk that yes. go in and to to these councils no question about it but it's hard work i should imagine um having um, to deal with with the the opposition and that kind of thing the chap ran a fantastic campaign um i remember uh it was almost the offer unity days that he won that. Um, but I nobody had him doing his even close to winning. Uh, no. But I smashed it at the park. Well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about local councils, one of the things that Gordon Brown wants to do here is to investigate mm. m- uh, more mayors for Scottish towns and cities. Like you know, he's got his 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 his, uh, his English mayors in these metropolitan cities. He wants to extend mayoral ships. But I don't really understand. Do you, do you no. understand what's meant? Why? What's the big thing about having a mayor? I, I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, I don't think it's really got the same uh, feeling as it does in England. Uh, where, whereas a lot of your um, uh, like council areas are very rural and spread out. You know, a, a mayor doesn't make sense, really. I can mm. understand Edinburgh and Glasgow, maybe Aberdeen, stuff like that. But I, I don't think you would need to put mayors in Fife or Stirling or Falkirk or any, anything like that, or Highland. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but I, I see what he's... Uh, anything that takes power away from Holyrood and decentralises Holyrood is great. But again, I don't trust Gordon Brown and his schemes. No. Uh, for for uh, He's mucked it up so many times before. No. Um, something that we've always been strong at, strong on, is if you devolve power to the ca- the local councils in Scotland, then rather than have them answerable to Holyrood, they should be answerable to say Westminster. Yes. So you so you've got like a three way balance of power, mm-hmm. because if the if you're devolving from Holyrood to the council, then basically Holyrood is still in control. Yes. Of the council. It's uh, in control of everything that, that's going on and control of ultimately of all those powers. So if you actually say, no, it's British power we're going to give to the local council, mm-hmm. then that bypasses Holyrood. And it means that the council is responsible to both to both, uh, to both both parts. So it's like a three-way, a triangle, three-way balance of power um, rather than just have rather than just devolve everything to Holyrood and then say you then devolve it mm. downwards. That's that's just really giving more power to yeah. to whoever is running Holyrood. Stephen Beer's got a good comment. Is the trough deep enough for mayors to dig in as well? I mean, this is uh, so very true what you're saying. We've already got an overabundance of politicians in Scotland. Mm. I mean, you oh, yeah. look at Manchester, was Arnie, uh, Andy Burnham, he's just the mayor. Uh, whereas we've got a bit of population here some of these cities, uh, and we've got, you know, 50, 60, 100 MSPs, <laughs> and we still kind of get anything right. So you're yes. right, Stephen, uh, I think we need an extension to the trough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we need to get another couple of metres. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, um, what does this button do? It says at least Brown supports the UK. Well, that's that's right, and that's yeah, uh, at least one, one thing that he's got going for him, but I don't want his support of the UK to... You know, muck let's hope they to it, muck it up. Yeah, yeah, he's he's in danger of mucking things up. But who knows? It's it's still got to get past Keir Starmer, and he's Keir Starmer's still got to get elected in the first place. So who knows what will happen? However, I am writing a, a an article which will summarise all of this, and that should be um, online either tomorrow or on Friday, um, so that people understand exactly what is being planned because this is it's really quite big. You know, Lengthy ones, it says 79 pages worth. Uh, 155, 155 oh, wow. pages. It's, it's a weighty tome, very much a weighty tome. It's um, it's almost five to eight, so we're going to call this to an end. Niall, thanks very much for giving, for expanding upon that two-minute video in, the way, pleasure, that, in, the, in the way that you did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks very much for coming your, on. Um, your great commenters and your great listeners. So thanks very, very much for having me on. And uh, once again, I hope to come back again. Well, you'll be very welcome. And we'll get our assistant producer to contact you about coming back on in the not too distant future. Perfect. And um, telling us more about your political career, which hopefully okay. will go well. <laughs>
Right, take care, my friend. Thank you. Okay, now, good night. Great stuff. Thank you, Niall, for that. Christopher says, thank you. Great contributions. Derek says, great show, guys. Christopher says about the councils. This is a vital point. We councils being responsible to the UK Parliament too. Otherwise, it is simply incestuous. That's the word. Also, the funding for councils comes from Westminster. Yes, indeed. Okay, folks. Um, I'm being told that we don't have a winner of the badge. So I'm going to ask the question again and send your answer to contact at aforceforgood.uk and if somebody comes in in the next two minutes then it might be you. If you haven't done it before you're in with a good chance. <clears throat> I just want to mention something before I go and I'll mention this book again, but this arrived in our office. It's Fellowship and Fairy Dust, Happy and Glorious, a Royal Celebration. Now, this arrived in our office because I personally actually have an article in it. And it is, my, my article is on the purpose of the monarch. This is produced by a couple of Americans. Um, well, in fact, an American group. And it's a literary magazine inspiring faith and creativity and exploring the arts through a spiritual lens. We follow in the footsteps of J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, George MacDonald, and others who combined their Christian sacramental imagination with a love of storytelling. So, an unusual document but it is about 160 pages and it's got lots of different articles around the concept of royalty from an often from an american perspective as well and extremely well published it's published simply by amazon but i mean amazing amazing pictures that you can that you can get now you know if you if you're on amazon prime it'll arrive within 48 hours because Amazon just like run it off the printers. So that's, we'll put up the link to that in the thread. Good. Well, the lady that publishes it as well, we're going to have to get her on, it occurs to me. Avelina Balestri. Avelina Balestri, editor-in-chief. We'll maybe get her on the program later this year from America. It is a great publication and it makes us want to do something similar, which we are going to do this year. We had a director's meeting last week and we decided that we would publish our first major book this year, this autumn. So I'm going to be spending the next couple of months writing that or at least assembling materials and putting it into into a book. And it's going to be the first in a series of union books. We've got it all figured out. Well, folks, we do have a winner, I'm glad to say, at long last. And... Let's put up the name of that. The answer was, of course, Jutland. I asked what was the naval battle today. It was the Battle of Jutland. And Debbie is the winner. Fantastic, Debbie. We'll get that straight off to you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Glad that you won. Stuart says, great stuff as usual. Harry says, congrats, Debbie. Folks, it's the top of the hour. We're going to be back next week. 
when we have a, another special guest. Next week we've got David Scott back on. I'm pleased to say he's always a fantastic guest, a fantastic thinker and speaker and writer and presenter. So looking forward to that next week. So in the in the meantime, Debbie says, excellent. One each for me and Steve now. Great. <laughs> so folks, it just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. We'll see you next week. <laughs>